Come on, let's praise King Jesus. He is holy. He is worthy. He is in this place. Wow. Anybody else feel the presence of God in the room? Father, we just acknowledge this is all about you. This is all about one name. And it's your name, for your name is the highest name. Your name is the greatest name. There is no name that compares to the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, enemies flee. At the name of Jesus, sickness bows. At the name of Jesus, a sinner is forgiven. At the name of Jesus, a soul is saved for eternity at the name of Jesus mountains move and today we take a moment to honor your presence in this place we we thank you God for all that you have done this weekend and I firmly believe God you have saved the best till now and we just want to say thank you for your presence thank you for your power thank you for meeting us here today. I thank you that there is not one person that you desire to leave the same way as when they walked in. But I thank you as we encounter your presence, it's more than a feeling. God, your presence brings change. It brings transformation. It brings healing. It brings wholeness to our lives. And so we are expectant to walk out of here different to how we came in, for we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the Youth Weekend Sunday. You know, I just, I want to say this. God has really shown up these past two days. And... The first night, we had another youth pastor sharing his testimony and invited young people to this altar right here. And I think there were two young people left in their seat. Just floods came down. The same last night. And what God is doing in the lives of young people is special and I just want to thank you for praying because honestly, for those in the room, we we can say for certain we felt the prayers. We felt the prayers. I want to say to every young adult in our church, thank you for serving, for making a, a way for young people to have the experience that they had. I want to thank our amazing team for just spending months working hard, preparing, planning um, to make this weekend possible. I want to give an amazing shout out to our worship team. They have led so strong all, all weekend. You guys are amazing and Paddington who's helped lead that too and what an offering message. And you know, all of this is possible because we have senior pastors who believe in the next generation and allow us to do what we do. So I want to thank you, Pastor Mark, Pastor Jillian, Mom and Dad, for just letting us loose. And I believe because of that, many, many people are going to be in heaven one day because of your obedience and your willingness. So thank you. To God be the glory. And um, man, if you're new to church today, wondering what you walked into, um, this ain't no library. Um, this is this is a place where broken people gather, and we realise we've got nothing without Jesus. And so, 
if, if you're on the outskirts looking in today, you're a part of the family too. You're a part of the family too, so welcome. Welcome to church. My name is Caleb. I'm the youth pastor here, and I get the privilege of uh, speaking for a few moments today. So I want to take us, uh, and I'm going to ask that we just remain standing for a few more moments um, whilst we read the Word of God together. I'm going to take us to the book of First Samuel chapter 17, and before we come to the first verse that we're going to read together, let me give you some context. First Samuel is found in the Old Testament of the Bible. And before we begin reading in verse 20, what you need to know that happens in the previous 19 verses is that there is a man by the name of Jesse. Jesse has eight sons. The youngest of the eight sons is a boy by the name of David. Jesse asks his son David to take some food to his three oldest brothers who are right now uh, fighting with the Israelite or for the Israelite army against the Philistines. And so that's where we pick up the story in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says this, Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, because that was his responsibility, taking care of his father's sheep, loaded up and set out as Jesse, his father, had directed he reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lions, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lions and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from uh, his lions and shouted his usual defiance and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. We know from the Bible that Goliath was a nine foot, nine inch giant of a man. So it's no surprise people were a little bit scared of him. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see this man? How this man keeps coming out. He comes out to defy Israel. The king, whose name is Saul, will give him great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his, his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. How many of you would have stepped forward at that offer? Even if she was ugly. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He's got a bit of sass. They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him. Now let's fast forward to verse 31. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul the king, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. He might be young, but he's a gangster. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now let's move to verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. 
Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome. And he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Oh, but David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then he starts to prophesy, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. We're coming into land. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Last verse. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. I want to preach from the title this morning, The Sword is yours. The sword is yours. Father, have your way in this place. May we have a heart to receive. May we have ears to hear. And may we have eyes to see everything you have for us. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. A few months ago, I was introduced, um, I don't even know what you would call it, a trend, possibly, um, but it, it had become kind of viral online, and so I, I was introduced it and, and to it, and to be honest, it, it, it kind of blew my mind a little bit, and it, and it was this thing called girl math. A- anybody heard of girl math before? Okay, um, I'm, about to, I'm about to explain girl math to you as it was explained to me. Okay, let me give you some examples. Let, let's say you buy an item of clothing and it's on sale. What girl math teaches us is that you actually made a profit when you bought that item. Are you tracking? So if the item was 50 pounds originally, and you paid 25, you're actually 25 pounds better off. It's girl math. Okay? Let's say you like to go out for coffee, maybe to Starbucks, and and, and let's say today you you preload your Starbucks gift card with money, and then you go to Starbucks tomorrow, and you pay for the drinks using your preloaded gift card, it makes the drinks free. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying? This is girl math. Okay? Now, now, as I was doing some extensive research for this message, I came across a, a TikTok video um, where all great theology is, is found. And there, there was a lady explaining um, girl math on TikTok. And, and she said this. She said, I... I I thought I had to go and get the oil changed in my car. And it was going to cost me about 75 pounds. But when I went to the car garage 
And the mechanic came out and he looked at the car. He said, hey, I've got some great news for you. You've actually got uh, more mileage left in the car before you need to get your oil changed. So she said, today I've made 75 pounds. <laughs> it's girl math. Now, it is the youth weekend. And so what I, what I thought I would do for a moment today is, is take us to school for just a moment. Now, I know when you're in school, uh, the first thing you want to do is get out of school, but we're, we're just going to go to class for a moment. Is that okay? Will, will, you, will you track with me uh, for a moment? Now, here's the thing. Girl math is not going to help you in life. Okay? If you, if you build your financial portfolio based on girl math, you will be broke before you know it. So I'm not going to teach you about girl math today, but I'm going to teach you about something else. It's called God math. Let's talk about God math for a moment. So class is in session. I'm going to take us to two verses in the Bible in order to help us understand God math. Because if you will understand God math, you will see life completely differently, maybe to how you see it right now. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. James 1, 17. Let's read this. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And just to be clear, it's not referring to the sky. It's saying it's coming down from the Father, who is God, of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Now let's go to the second verse that's going to help us understand today's lesson. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Okay, so now I'm going to get visual in today's lesson, and I want you to turn your attention to my whiteboard. We're going to learn a bit of God math today. Are you ready? We're going to take these two scriptures, and I want to illustrate something to you today based on God math. Let's say today you're a believer and you have God in your life. Let's throw that up there. So you have God. Now let's say you have God in your life and you have a good thing in your life. So that means God plus a good thing. Whatever that good thing is, you've got a good thing in your life and you've got God in your life. So if we take God and we add it with a good thing, here's what you get. For my good. So if you've got God, and you've got a good thing, it equates to for my good. Are you tracking with me so far? So when I've got God in my life, and I've got a good thing in my life, I can know this, it is working out for my good. Okay, you're great students this morning. Now let's go to the second equation. Let's also say you've got God in your life. So let's start again. We've got God. Okay, but now let's say you don't have a good thing in your life. You've got a bad thing in your life. So let's do God plus a bad thing. I don't know what that bad thing is. I, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's financial difficulties. Maybe it's relational troubles. I don't know, it could be any manner of things, but you've got God in your life, but you've also got a bad thing in your life. Now, now, now here, here's, here's, here's where I want us to get to today in this God math lesson. If you have God and you have a bad thing, according to Romans 8.28, here's how it's going to work out. For my good. Now, now, I don't know whether you're seeing this right now, so let, let, let's put the two equations next to one another. God plus a good thing is working out for my good. God plus a bad thing is working out for my good. This is what I like to call God math. Because according to James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes from God. So if it came from God, I know it's working for my good. 
But how many of you know not everything in our lives comes from God? There are bad things we experience in our lives. But according to Romans 8.28, if it didn't come from God, if it wasn't God sent, it can still be God used. So if God was not the source, God can still do a work in that situation and work it for my good. So in the words of DJ Khaled, as Christians, all we do is win. Now, now I want to address something because, because let's be honest, it doesn't always feel like we're winning. So you may hear me say, as Christians, all we do is win. And you can be sat there going, well, to be honest, Caleb, my life right now don't feel like a win. Well, here's what we know from God math. That if right now it doesn't feel like a win, it simply means God's not done working it out for your good. So whether you're in a good thing right now or a bad thing, I want you to remember this lesson today. That it all equates to the same thing if God is in my life. That he is working all things together for my good. Either it came from him and it's good, or it didn't come from him, but he's working it together for my good. I think that would be a great place to take a praise break right now this morning. So in 1 Samuel 17 that we read just a few moments ago, we see David given an assignment from his father to go and take bread to his brothers. He gets to the battle line and he hears Goliath taunting Israel. The same taunt taunt that for 40 days straight, Goliath has given to the Israelite army. But whilst everybody heard it and ran in fear, David heard it and stepped forward in confidence. And we know from this story that David would come at Goliath with a slingshot and a stone. And with one swing of that thing, he would kill Goliath on the spot. But as we know, he didn't end it there. He added insult to injury. And he goes over to Goliath who is dead, lying on the floor, and he takes Goliath's sword and he chops off his head. Now, you may be familiar with the story of David and Goliath, but you may not know what comes after the story of David and Goliath. It's quite probable that you would read 1 Samuel 17 and stop there. But what I want us to see today is what follows this great victory of David's. After David has defeated Goliath, the Philistines run in fear. Because they realize our champion, the guy in who we had put all of our hope, is now dead. So the Philistines run for their lives and the Israelites are like, this is awesome. Let's chase after them. These dudes are are all a normal height now. We can take them. So the Israelites chase down the Philistines. They kill lots of them and then they loot the army and return home with all of the spoils. King Saul knew David at this point. And I'm not going to go into all of the detail, but you can read it another time. But he sends for David and he asks David who who his family is. And whilst he's having this interaction, Jonathan, who is King Saul's son, becomes like David's best friend. There's just this connection between Saul's son, Jonathan, and, and David. And King Saul makes a decision in that moment to keep David as close to him 
as possible and does not allow him to return home to his family. The Bible says that whenever Saul would send David out on a mission, David would experience success wherever he went. Now, as the Israelite army are coming home, all of the women come out of the house celebrating, singing, and they're full of joy because they're their husbands, their sons, the men in their life have just won a great victory. And the Bible says that they begin to sing a song that goes like this, Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Now, when you hear that kind of song being sung in your life, you have two options. Do I celebrate that David's victory is my victory? Or do I make an enemy out of a friend? And sadly, Saul chose the latter. And the Bible says that Saul became very angry when he heard this song. That the women of the the nation were accrediting him with killing thousands, but now David with tens of thousands. And the Bible says that from that moment, Saul kept a very close eye on David. I want to say this to you today. Be careful that you don't spend all of your energy on the wrong enemy. David wasn't Saul's enemy. David was Saul's asset. But Saul would spend the rest of his days making an enemy out of someone that actually benefited his life greatly. And I just think if I were the devil, I would love to distract you by putting all of your energy into the wrong fight. Be careful that you don't spend all of your energy fighting the wrong enemy. So so Saul is back at his home, his palace. David is in the room with him. And David, as we know from previous chapters, is a very skilled musician. And David is playing the lyre, a stringed instrument, in the presence of King Saul. And the Bible says that an evil spirit comes on Saul and he's sitting there. I mean, this is a little bit creepy. He's sitting there with a, 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 a spear in his hand on his throne. An evil spirit comes on him and he eyes up David across the room and he takes his spear and hurls it in David's direction. And I don't think this was like a game. <laughs> I, I, I think he, he, he might have wanted to do some damage to young David. David thankfully manages to elude David, uh, Saul on two separate occasions. So David gets away from, from Saul and, and his life is, is spared. Saul now is thinking of another way he can take out this boy David. He's not content with just releasing him from his his army and sending him him home. He wants to eradicate him from the face of the earth. So he thinks to himself, I know what I'll do. I will pair him up with my daughter. Because if I can pair him up with my daughter, I think she will become a distraction to him. And that way, the enemy will have a greater chance at getting to him. Now David recognizes he has come from humble beginnings and therefore cannot afford to pay the price that would be put on a king's daughter. So Saul says, I'm going to make it real easy for you, David. You don't have to pay me any money. I simply want 100 Philistines dead. 
He actually asks for 100 Philistine foreskins, but I, I didn't think that would bless you very much on a Sunday morning, so I just went for the PG version. Some of you complain about your tasks. Imagine being the guy having to count. <laughs> You are never going to complain to your boss ever again. I'll make the tea all day long. Now again, this is a... <laughs> Move on. This is a, a plot from Saul. Because he thinks, if I, if I task David with killing a hundred Philistines, the Philistines are going to kill him before he has chance to kill them. But because God was with David, David not only killed 100 Philistines, he killed 200 Philistines. I mean, if you're going to do a job, do it well. And so Saul is realizing this is a problem. God is with this young man and God has departed from me. And the Bible specifically says that Saul remained David's enemy the rest of his days. Now yet again, Saul tries to take David's life. We have another incident with a spear. It's pretty crazy. And David, the Bible says, this time makes good his escape. He's tried to be as honorable to the king as possible, but he realizes if I stick around any longer, this ain't ending well. So David makes good his escape. Saul comes to his son Jonathan and says to Jonathan, remember who is David's best friend, Jonathan, I want this boy dead. Jonathan says, I, I don't get it, dad. What harm has he ever done to you? Why would you want to harm him what he has done for you has been of great benefit. So Saul says, cool, I get it, I won't kill him. David is brought back to Saul. Saul tries to kill him again. And this time, Jonathan puts his own life in danger in order to protect David. And now Saul tries to kill his very son. So Jonathan lets David know, hey, this is not a good situation. You need to go on your way. And this is where I want us to pick up the story four chapters later in 1 Samuel 21. And this is what it says. David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest. Now, of course, David here is covering up for what is really going on. He doesn't want people to know the true situation. So he says, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Again, this is just a cover story. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us as usual. Whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. Now you may not understand some of the verses that we've just read, and that's fine, I'm not going to go into detail. But here's what I want us to see, verse 8. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. 
The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. What I want you to see is this four chapters prior. David goes out to battle against Goliath. And David has a slingshot and a stone in his possession. He's looking in the face of a nine foot nine inch giant named Goliath. Goliath has a shield bearer in front of him and he has a sword wrapped around his waist. That sword had been fashioned to take out whoever would come against Goliath. Goliath knew on that day this sword could well be the death of this young man. But David, with confidence in his God, as we already know, with one swing of that slingshot, took out the giant and he fell to the ground dead. He comes over to Goliath, takes that same sword meant for his destruction and now cuts off the head of Goliath. We hear nothing else about the sword until four chapters later. David is on the run for his life. He's had no time to make preparations, no time to gather food, and no time to gather any weapons. And he comes to a place where there is a priest named Ahimelech, and he says, Ahimelech, Do you have a weapon I can use? And Ahimelech says, I have only one. It's the sword of Goliath. And David takes hold of the sword that was meant for his destruction four chapters ago. And the sword that was in his enemy's hand is now a sword in his hand. You see, the Bible says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But I want to take it a step further today and say this, the weapon that was formed against you will become a weapon that works for you. (laughs) And so David now possesses the same sword that Goliath once held with the intent of taking his life. I want to say this to you today. You may have many things that throughout the course of your life, no matter how short or long it has been, that have tried to take you out. I don't know what they have been. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. Maybe you've gone through bankruptcy. Maybe you've gone through a season of depression. Maybe a coach dropped you from a team. Maybe you've been through seasons of fear and anxiety. Maybe someone turned their back on you, said some stuff about you, and you feel like they got the last laugh. Maybe that divorce took everything from you. Maybe that bankruptcy left you dry. Maybe what that person said about you took all the ounces of confidence and self-belief you had left. And that may well be true, but I do know this, that situation, that season, that circumstance left you with one thing, and it left you with a sword. 
the sword that the enemy fashioned for your demise is now a sword in your hand. The weapon formed against you is now a weapon working for you. And we know in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Let me tell you what the sword represents. The sword represents the experience that you got from the battle that you faced. And if you will use the sword, it will not only benefit you, but it will benefit others also. I love this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Pastor Mark pointed it out to me just this week. He, it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that, so that, we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You see, if it hadn't been for the trouble, you would not have known His comfort. And if you had not have received His comfort, Today, you would not be carrying a sword. But because of the trouble that brought about his comfort, you now have a sword to show for it. A sword that will not only bring comfort to you in seasons to come, because it represents his faithfulness, how he never left you nor forsake you, how he brought you through the battle, but it's a sword you can now use so that when you see somebody else going through it, you can say, hey, I've already been there. I've already seen it. And I've got the sword to show for it. You know, you know like when you go on holiday, what do you like to bring back off a holiday? A souvenir. Did you know today from the battle you faced, from the season of trial you've been through, you've got a souvenir. You've got a souvenir. And the souvenir is a sword. The souvenir is a sword. You see, here's how many of us as Christians live. We live as victims to our battles. We think the one who wronged us kept the sword. <laughs> we think the one who tried to take us out kept the sword. We think the one who did wrong to us kept the sword. They, they may have taken a lot of things from you, but the one thing they don't possess is the sword. The sword today, friends, is yours. <laughs> the weapon formed against you is now a weapon working for you. It's not a sword in their hands, it's a sword in yours. So stop walking around like a victim. I'm not here to diminish what you've been through or what you're going through. But I am here to say this, you have a sword you may have known nothing about. You're not a victim. You're a victor. You're a victor. I want to close with this. I want to close with this. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Earlier this year, seven of us from this church, we went on a trip to Atlanta. And on this trip, we, we decided, come on, let's, let's, let's have some fun. We went to a student Christian conference with 60,000 other Christians. 
And so, you know, there were, there were three, three guys, four girls. We thought, come on, let's, let's have a laugh. Let's have, let's have some fun. So we decided, girls v. guys, we're, we're going to pull some pranks on one another. And the prank was this. Whenever we get into a public environment and there are lots of other people, we're going to pretend it's someone in our group's birthday. So for instance, one of the guys would shout, Hey, it's my friend's birthday today. Let's sing. (laughs) So whether we were in the arena or whether we were walking the streets, we would get lots of people singing happy birthday to someone whose birthday it wasn't. And of course, you know, being sung happy birthday to it is awkward when it is your birthday. Let, an, let alone when it's not. So this, this kind of went on for the week. So boys took the lead 1-0, girls got us back. Boys took the lead again. And so we're getting on the flight to come home. It's 2-1 to the boys. We're thinking, trip's over. We got this. We won. The girls had other ideas. They thought, you know what? We, we may have left American soil, but we've still got an eight-hour plane journey <laughs> to try this thing out. So unbeknownst to us, they, they plotted a bit of a scheme. And, and the scheme that they, they plotted was, we're going to tell the, the cabin crew, <laughs> it's one of the guy's birthdays. And they're hoping for ultra embarrassment, maybe a song over the tannoy, I don't know, the cabin around them to start singing. They're just hoping we're going to get these jokers back. Well, anyway, what happened was they speak to the cabin crew and they say, it's, uh, it's this guy's birthday. You see sat over there? His name's Cameron, poor Cameron. It's Cameron's birthday. And it's his 21st birthday, actually. So we were hoping, you know, as he's chosen to fly with you, that you would, you know, take good care of him. Yeah, no problem. Leave it with us. Anyway, a few moments go by. And one of the air stewardesses comes over to Cameron with a card signed by the entire crew (laughs) wishing him a very happy birthday. And a big thank you for choosing to fly with us. But it didn't stop at the card. They said, as it's a special birthday, we've got a bottle of champagne just for you. Just for you, Cameron. And to to top it all off, you know the amenity kits that they get in first class? We know you're not in first class, but we thought we'd get you a white company leather pouch with all of the amenities to go with it. Now listen, when I, when I heard this story, I thought, that'll preach right there. Because the plot backfired. <laughs> and I'm here to announce to you today that the plot over your life has backfired. That the thing the enemy meant for your destruction, oh baby, he's working it together. He's working it together for your good. And you're going to be able to say like Joseph, what you meant for my evil, God has turned it around and he's working it for my good. We're going to worship. And I want you to say right now, enemy is backfired. Your plan over my life is backfired. The sword in your hand is now a sword in mine. Here's what I want us to do with no one moving around. This is the most important moment of today. I'm speaking right now to those of you that are looking on and going, I don't know this Jesus. 
You've been preaching about, I don't know this Jesus. You've been singing about, it looks personal to you, but it's not personal to me. Can I say this Jesus, He loves you. He came as God to this earth to live a perfect life that you and I could not live so that He could die a sinner's death in your place and pay for all of your wrongdoing and my wrongdoing. And as He hung on the cross, experiencing the most excruciating death, He did it with you on His mind so that in a moment like this, you could have the opportunity to say yes to Him. You say, Caleb, what have I got to do? Well, it begins with the recognition that I need Him, that I am a sinner far from God, and I need Jesus. And simply then, I believe that He is who He says He is, and that He's done what He says He's done. And friend, in that moment, you are saved. And you get to live your life in relationship with a God, not who is dead, but who is alive. And He wants to make His home within your heart. And in that moment, you can have assurance that one day you're going to be with Him in heaven. I need to tell you, friend, there is a place called heaven. There is also a place called hell. And without a relationship with Jesus and without an acknowledgement of Him as Lord and Savior over your life, Friend, you are heading for eternity in hell. But with Jesus and because of Jesus, you don't have to fear that. You can know with assurance and certainty today, heaven is my home. Jesus is my Savior. So if that is you today and you need to respond, you don't know where you stand with God, today you can be certain of it. On the count of three, I simply want you to raise a hand all over this room if I'm speaking to you. And by doing that, it's an outward declaration of an inward commitment. Jesus sees that hand. He sees the desire of your heart and He comes rushing in. So if that is you today on the count of three, just simply raise up a hand and I'm going to wait for all of the hands to go up. And then the entire church are going to pray a prayer together. If that is you, one, today's your day. Two, don't hold off, don't wait another moment. Three, all over this place, would you lift your hand without shame, embarrassment? Thank you so much. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Anybody else? Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Come on, church, let's rejoice with those today. Anyone else? Beautiful. We're so proud of you. Well, right now we're going to pray. A prayer together for your benefit right now. If you just lifted a hand, this is for you, but we're a family, so we're going to support you in it. So church, let's say this together. Jesus, today I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe today you are my Savior. So I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, and become my leader and my Lord, I surrender my life to you. You know what is best. And I ask that I may walk with you all the days of my life. Thank you that you died to forgive me of my sin. And you rose again victorious to give me life. Today, I'm a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate with heaven. Right now, those who made that decision, Pastor God, over to you.